All right. Hello and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Alana here with my friend Mackenzie. How are you? Good. We are going to be doing something fun and different. So Mackenzie is a huge reader and has read all nine books in the Kennedy Stern series. And we've been chatting about them and she comes up with great questions. So I invited her to come on and we're just going to have a fun, casual discussion about prayer lessons, I guess, and the topics that come up about prayer in the Kennedy series. So you don't have to have read them and we're not going to give any big spoilers. If you're interested, I'll include a link so you can get the nine books. But I think this will just be another fun way. We talk a lot on the show about how lots of things can be springboards for prayers, even things that don't sound like a traditional, like here is my Bible study that I open and it tells me what to pray. Yeah. So this is a fun idea. I don't know that we've ever talked about fiction being used as a springboard for prayer. Yeah. I think with the Kennedy books, the biggest thing was it's okay to ask the question, what is prayer? Yeah. But like more than once in your life. <laughs> uh -huh. We get if you grow up in church or maybe you've been a Christian for a while, you think, well, I've answered that question. Therefore, I never have to revisit it again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and Kennedy walks through that, I think, through the whole book of her idea of what prayer is, is morphing and changing as not because God changes, but because her experiences deepen her faith. Right, right. And it's good to ask that question. And it's okay. Like, it's not shameful to have yeah. a doubt about, I don't, no, I'm not sure what prayer is anymore. I'm not sure how it would respond. Right. Well, and you know, we've talked in some of our chats, like the difference between a Sunday school answer, Yeah. <laughs> you know, like the Sunday school answers, well, prayer is talking to God. Mm -hmm. What does that actually mean? You know? <laughs> and it was okay at the time. Cause at the time, maybe when you heard prayers talking to God, that's all you could understand. Right. Right. But as you grow, it, it grows even more. Mm -hmm. And I think to be okay with asking that question to God, like he's not okay. upset at you for asking. Exactly, it, you exactly. Know? I love it. Well, before we dive into talking about the candy, we let's start with a just oh. fun question. So I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, you know how bands will cover songs, right? So oh, like yeah. you wrote a song, I love it. So I'm going to get your permission to cover it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You love to read. If you could cover any novel, <laughs> Oh. So you can rewrite it and give it a different ending, or you could just write it in a different way, or you could basically write it exactly the same as the original, but like make it yours. Oh my. Um, okay. Right now I just been read the Fable Haven series mm -hmm. and I would rewrite it, but make it national parks. Oh, okay. Instead. So what is it now? Um it's just these sanctuaries for oh, mythical okay. creatures okay. or whatever. But I think it would be fun if national parks were actually sanctuaries for oh, mythical uh -huh. creatures. But only <laughs> kids can see them. That's cute. So that's why some of these things happen in national parks that we don't understand. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> It'd be fun. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's dive into Kennedy. Do you have um, questions you want to start us off with? Or how do you want yes. to start? Yes. Okay. okay. So... How, what, what is your first memory of when someone explained prayer to you? I'm sure it came from my dad mm -hmm. and he, he really modeled prayer and we prayed together, but I think I also kind of subconsciously picked up, this is what adults do. Mm -hmm. Like he would have, um, church meetings at our home or sometimes like he was one of the elders at church and he'd go and do these visitations with people and I would tag along and so he'd pray with them and so in a way like I learned two lessons one was that like prayer is super important but I also kind of learned like oh prayer is what grown-ups do mm -hmm. you know and then I'm supposed to just like you know play quietly and not interrupt and there was nothing conscious about my you know like my dad wasn't actively trying to teach me that but I think it's just kind of how I interpreted things and we prayed together too but I remember thinking like I need to be an adult before I can pray like my dad does I feel that even now do you <laughs> like one thing from the books um Ken Kennedy's always like well this other character does it right better yeah um was there ever a time in your life or a person in your life where you're like, oh, well, they're the person I need to ask to pray for me or for this? Yeah, daughter. yeah. I remember before I started writing The Love of Daughter, my first novel, I invited a woman from our church because I really looked up to her as a prayer warrior. Um, and that was really special. 
And then when our son was in the NICU, I had this thought in my head because, you know, like even one of the Kennedy books even deals with like faith healings and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I walk the line of, yes, I believe in miraculous healings, but I also don't believe that just because you take your kid to some, you know, acclaimed faith healer that they're going to, you know, that God's forced to heal them because Mm -hmm. this guy said the prayer. But I did have this question of like, what if there's just one person like, what if there's one person in the world who could pray for my son and make him better, but like, how do I find him and how does he know about us? And so there, I think, yeah, there are different times in my life. um, Sometimes where it was like, okay, this is a person I want to pray for me before I start this project. But then there was also like, I felt like, like there was something missing, like, Mm. and, and I don't, I don't really think it's true. I do believe that like the Bible says, God gives us everything we need for life and godliness. So I take that to mean, if there truly was someone who was meant to pray for me, that God would make our paths cross and it, it would have come. But I remember wrestling with that being like, I mean, that's pretty tragic, isn't it? Like mm-hmm. one person who prays for one minute could change my family's life, but they don't know where I am. Like, that's a sad thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even that thought in the Kennedy books is like your prayer affects people, mm-hmm. a specific mm-hmm. person. Yeah. Um, was there a time in your life, maybe it's the same time where you realized prayer was that powerful. Like it could affect someone you don't even know. Yeah. So do you know what the operation world, like it's this big encyclopedia book Mm -hmm. and it has every single country of the world and it has compiled um, like demographics, but also prayer points for every single country of the world. And it's probably like 1200 pages or something. Mm -hmm. So I remember being a newlywed, and making a commitment I'm going to pray for every country in this book well and I got through to the seas I'm like oh this I mean it's like praying over an encyclopedia like it it Mm -hmm. really was like that um and I was I was just kind of bored I felt like I was praying the exact same things and you know how sometimes you feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling Mm -hmm. like what's the point and I remember challenging myself I don't believe this was like a word from God that was a promise but I think it was just I considered a mental hack. And the question I asked myself was, what if I knew that every day that I prayed for a different country, that somebody in that country would be saved who otherwise wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into, well, of course I wouldn't want to forget. Of course I wouldn't put it off. Of course Mm -hmm. it wouldn't feel boring. And so that kind of helped fuel my prayers thinking of it that way. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have the temptation to feel maybe guilty or overwhelmed? Because Kennedy goes through that where mm-hmm. she's almost overwhelmed and then it starts this cycle. Like, <laughs> overwhelmed, guilt. I'm like, that is so relatable. Yeah. Um, I think that like there is a shame spiral that impacts our prayers mm-hmm. all the time. And it's okay. Well, I'm not praying enough. It's almost like, I don't know if you have a, a, like a relative like this, like if enough time goes by and you don't call them, <laughs> then you feel like even worse. So it's like, well, I can't call yeah. now because it's been six months. I feel like mm-hmm. sometimes we do that with the Lord. It's like, well, I haven't prayed for all these unsaved people in my life and that list is just growing bigger. So we we almost get to the sense of like, what's the point? It's almost mm-hmm. like when your to-do list gets so unmanageable that you just do nothing because you like, it feels like it's not going to make any difference at all. So I think it's really, really common. And I know you and I have talked about this. I just well, a long time ago learned to accept that like, I'm always going to feel like I'm falling short in some area. Mm-hmm. And that really freed me up to like, stop worrying about that. So instead of being like, I'm never going to pray for everybody on the list and keep up the house and write these books and parent my kids and be the wife I want to be and blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm never going to do all of those perfectly in any 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. So I, I've just kind of learned to be like, but you know, I can do this a little bit now, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. In that too, do you feel like prayer or, or maybe in what ways does prayer reflect what we believe about God? Yeah, I think that's huge because I think that sometimes, um, I think if somebody really wants to deepen their prayer life, I think you do need to do a little bit of um, introspective theology work Mm -hmm. because if you believe that prayer, some people believe that prayer is just kind of like a, a discipline. It's just a duty. 
and God is going to do what God's going to do no matter what. So it's kind of like saying, um, God says, Alana, I want you to pray for Mackenzie. I want you to pray that she has a great day. I'm planning on giving her a great day no matter what, but I want you to pray it just so that I can like give you a pat on the head. <laughs> like, that's uh-huh. not really all that fun. You yeah. know, it's it's kind of like, um, I don't know. I, I'm sure there were parenting examples. It'd be like uh, telling your kid to clean the room after it's already done sort of thing. You know, it's like, it's not going to change anything anyway. Or Or it's like, you tell them clean your room, but they know you're just going to come and clean it the way you want it cleaned anyway. So in their mind, it's like, well, why do I bother? Mm-hmm. And I like to think of prayer as something that truly can change the outcome of things, you know? And I love the story of Hezekiah where like the prophet tells him you are sick and you will die. And he prays fervently. And then the prophet's like, oh, okay. God's decided to add some years to your life as a direct result of your prayer. So to me personally, I think that for my prayers to be effective and not just to be a have to, I kind of need to believe that there's something behind it, right? That Mm -hmm. something's going to be different in the world that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't prayed. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe there's biblical basis for it, but I'm not going to sit and argue it from the theology side because Mm -hmm. we also know, yes, God is sovereign. God knows what we need before we ask him and all of that. So I see that side too, but just for me, again, let's call it a mental hack. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I need to believe that it's making that much of a difference in order to put so much energy into it. Mm -hmm. And that God, we talk about this a lot, come to God, what you saying what you mean, not what you think he wants you to be. It's like when you go to a therapist and you're telling them everything is fine. Right. That's not the point of a therapist. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like God wants you to tell him where you are, even though he already knows where you are. Right. Right. And I think it's always better to start with kind of like the ugly prayer. Like if that's true where you are, if your prayer is, I am so mad at Mackenzie because of this or that, Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm being petty. (laughs) Like one of the worst things I did to my husband, it was in our first year of marriage and I got so mad at him and it was something so small. It was like, he cooked the rice a different way than I wanted the rice. (laughs) That that is truly um, how minor of a thing it was. I was very mad and also very pregnant. So give me some grace, (laughs) but I was aware enough to know it was a stupid reason to be mad. Mm -hmm. So I didn't tell him. And so he thought that I was... I, you know, like he thought it was it, like, I must have done something catastrophic to make her this mad at me. And so <laughs> for me, it's Bless. like, it's better to just be like, um, God, I know it's like petty for me to feel this way, mm-hmm. but I feel really sad that like, I'm, I'm trying to think of just some really silly example. Like, I feel really sad that the pastor called on me and not McK- or on McKinsey and not me to pray in Sunday school, you know, like uh-huh. even if on the surface you recognize that it maybe it is a petty reason to be upset. You still want to take that to God. Like I would feel so sad if my kid was sad about something, but thought that I'd be, um, I'd belittle him for caring. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, think about anything that would upset a kid, you know, someone laughed at me at school. I know it's silly, so I can't tell mom, but it made me sad. No, mom wants to know. (laughs) Yeah. And I think when we have been Christians for a long time, where you grow up in the church, you lose that wonder of that's part of prayer. Like God Mm -hmm. wants Mm -hmm. to know. He's like a parent that wants to know. And um, I think in the Kennedy series, like her coming from the background she is, Mm -hmm. she kind of, or it seems to me that she kind of wrestles with that. Like saying how she's actually Mm -hmm. doing God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And Kennedy's such a bookworm that (laughs) I don't know if you will agree with this or not mm-hmm. that prayer reminds me of how a bookworm brings a book everywhere they go mm-hmm. like you're waiting in line and they like right. pull out the book <laughs> like you can't sleep at night you pull, pull out, out the, the book. book and like I feel like that's an analogy for how prayer should be rather than uh-huh. waiting maybe I don't know why yeah. I thought of that in yeah the novels but <laughs> yeah no that's really really interesting because I I even think to my like pre-smartphone pre-podcast pre-audiobook days I woke up in the middle of the night like there isn't a ton to do and so mm-hmm. you lay in bed and you pray and now if I'm up for very long I'm like okay I guess I'll listen to an audiobook or something like yep. it, it has changed things for sure can you remember were there ever moments in your prayer journey where maybe there was a spike in growth like you talked about um, hmm. with your 
dad kind of teaching mm-hmm. you about prayer mm-hmm. but were there other like strong moments I remember one when I was a teen uh it was the day I realized that I could pray to God and tell him about the crush I had <laughs> because in my mind I thought that was so silly and so petty and wouldn't God be mad at me because you know I'm supposed to have my mind on things of heaven mm-hmm. and but then I remember like, no, I could, I could talk to God, you know, so like there was a time where like my prayer journal was kind of like a diary and a prayer journal, you know, mm-hmm. it was like, I could tell God about things that if I were to be like meta analyzing myself, I would be like, well, this is silly. God doesn't care. But then to realize actually, no, he does care, right? Like it's part of the human experience to Mm -hmm. have a crush on somebody when you're a teenager Mm -hmm. and it feels pretty darn significant when you're that age and so being able to come to God and be like God this is this is what's on my heart and realizing like he's not gonna laugh at me he's not Mm -hmm. gonna be mad at me because my mind's on a boy and not a you know the mission field or Mm -hmm. something that was really really impactful for me and then um really that that moment with my prayer encyclopedia that was another one that you know when I think about kind of moments that was another moment of like no I to me it was a crossroad it was am I gonna treat prayer just as something that I do to get my my good deeds from God or am I gonna treat prayer as something that like will go out and change the world Mm -hmm. you know like if I told you like Mackenzie if you floss your teeth twice a day you're going to end world hunger. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's going to feel different. Mm-hmm. But if I say, you need to floss your teeth, young lady, or you might get gum disease. <laughs> There's way different magnitude in it. Right. <laughs> um, do you find that writing novels kind of like helps you work out if, what did I say? Lost my train of thought. Like work out the situation. If I believe that prayer was this, mm-hmm. that faith feeling was, and then letting the character take that journey. Yeah, it definitely does because it's so funny. It really wasn't until you and I started to talk about the Kennedy books that I realized how much about it is prayer (laughs) because I didn't set out, like my goal was I'm going to write some Christian fiction as a means to encourage readers to pray. (laughs) You know, like, yeah, that wasn't in my mind. Um, To be fair, the beloved daughter, that was partially, it was like, I want to encourage people to pray for persecuted believers, Mm -hmm. but definitely not the Kennedy series. It wasn't like, I want to write books about prayer, but I want to make them interesting. So I'll put it in novel form. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think it was just, yeah, these were things that were on my mind and on my heart. And so it's like, um, you know, and I think it's Proverbs out of the overflow of the heart and the mouth speaks. I think it's the same for authors. It's like the things yeah. that you're you're wrestling with or thinking about are the things that, that make the, their way into your books. Why is that such a big epiphany for me? I don't know why it should be. <laughs> right. Um, we also, I think it was last week you were talking about how uh, telling a story, something in story form mm-hmm. does seem to stick with people yeah. more. Mm-hmm. I know at least for me, like you said, being able to read about prayer in a story and a girl yeah. who's kind of relatable for me personally. Right, right. I understand that. And that is kind of how Jesus teaches. He teaches in parables, in story yeah. and parables. Mm-hmm. Um, I get really sad. I I hear readers sometimes say things like, well, um, I, I get two camps. One is I'm not going to buy your novels because I only read the Bible. And then I'm like, okay, that's fine. But then there's also like, I love reading novels. I just wish I could love reading the Bible as much. Mm. And so there's like this guilt, like um, it would be like, I, I love sitting here talking with Mackenzie, but I know I should probably go to church. Like, why can't we have both? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Why can't I love sitting with you having a heart to heart and also like wave at you from the other side of the church. And like, <laughs> mm-hmm. so that's how I picture um, for, for readers who feel guilty that they, that they just love their novels. And like, I wish I could love the Bible that much. Like, why can't you have both? Right. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I had a great, I don't know that I've ever told you about my high school literature teacher, but he's the one who introduced me to crime and punishment. And I had two years with him as my teacher in high school. And it was, it was all literature classes, but by being in his class, I learned how to study the Bible so much better. Really? Because I learned how to do things like look for symbolism mm-hmm. and look for the parallels and look for the themes and, and like the, the repetitive things. So to me, 
being a good reader, even if you're reading a lot of novels, <laughs> helps you be a better reader when you're studying the Bible mm -hmm. as well. So um, I don't think that there, it doesn't have to be an either or. I have a very similar story. Like, yeah. I loved my high school English teacher. Uh -huh. She was not a Christian by any means, uh -huh. but she taught me how to study my Bible and yeah. she probably has no idea. Yeah. You know, she yeah. was in fact, probably doing the opposite in retrospect, like trying uh -huh. to work against, but I can tear apart the Bible the way I do now Yeah, because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Like God gives us Sometimes we love things that help him love him better. Yeah. More. <laughs> well, and, and sometimes like stories stay with us more so than a nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. You know, like I love historical fiction. I have learned so much more history from historical fiction than from a textbook. Mm -hmm. Right. And so some people like the stories are a better method for teaching, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because it, it stays with you longer. And so those like, what if this happened yeah. question yeah how would you react if yeah this happened are you familiar with the studies they've shown that people who read a lot of fiction have a greater sense of empathy no but I believe it mm -hmm. for sure because like it allows us to put ourselves in the shoes of other mm -hmm. people and to be like okay how would I react in that type of situation or like in the Kennedy novels I don't agree with what this character believes but I get where they're coming from mm -hmm. at the very least and some of them how am I supposed to pray when I don't know that experience mm -hmm. like I don't know the yeah. experience of being in some of those situations yeah but I can learn through somebody else, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another character. Yeah. When is the first time or when is a another strong moment in your life, maybe, where you realize that prayer is kind of like a wonder? I don't know what else to call it. Like, yeah. it is an amazing thing we take for granted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember once <laughs> trying to decide how... Uh... <laughs> How much I want to like scare people off with my really bizarre <laughs> stories. I'll share one that's kind of midline. Um, I remember once, so our son was in the NICU and had a lot of medical needs for years. Now, I remember once we had recently brought him home, he had a lot of brain damage from a traumatic birth experience. And I remember praying for him and I wasn't like, I didn't all like, I'm kind of centrist when it comes to laying on of hands. I'm like, it's not like you always have to do it, but it, mm -hmm. it's not like it's wrong to do it. And you're like weird if you want to. Um, so, and in this specific case, I really felt like I needed to put my hand on his forehead as I was praying specifically for the brain injuries that he had sustained. And um, have you ever, have you ever done that? And then your hands get really hot. Have you ever experienced something like that? Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> I told you it's going to get a little weird. But there, I was, don't... there was so much heat coming out of my hands that like I had to move it like six inches or more like this high away from him. It was almost like um, it was like oh. God was in this space in between his hand and, and or my hand and his forehead. Uh -huh. um, and I really sensed like a finality. I sensed like an amen. His mm -hmm. brain is healed. It kind of turned into, um, but then then there was a sense of, but I mean, it wasn't like we woke up the next morning and and his medical condition was 180 degrees different. Yeah. Like we still had to walk out that healing, but it was almost like in the in the heavenly reality, like it had already been done. It was mm -hmm. that was a really powerful experience. That's crazy. <laughs> How much of that is like? I had my own experience. I went to YWAM at one point in my life uh -huh. and that like opened my eyes to what if prayer could be all these other things. Right. So now I'm like, <laughs> um, what is the importance you think of remembering stuff like that? Like, is there something you do that you reflect on and just look at the ways God has fulfilled? Yeah. I feel um, like I love looking forward forward like I'm I'm always thinking about like to me it's already like you know next year <laughs> it's almost <laughs> always next year already in my head no matter what year it is yeah. in the calendar <laughs> but I love um find so I I almost need rituals to remind me to look back because mm. <laughs> otherwise I'm just I'm on to the next thing so yeah I like um I love gratitude journaling mm -hmm. so I, how it usually works for me is um not daily but multiple times a week I'll take like a quarter page of my journal and just write a list of things that I'm really thankful for until I get to like the bottom of that section. So that's one. Um, 
when I finish a big project, like I finish writing a novel or I finish the year or the school year ends, I'll, I'll sometimes do like um, an extended prayer journal time, just reflecting over almost like a debrief, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm debriefing with God <laughs> about um, things. And then um, it, my plant obsession, which isn't quite an obsession, <laughs> but you know, you can use what word you want. It actually started in a way is like, okay, this one's going to remind me of this thing, you know, oh, that I'm thankful really for. Cool. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of things like that I would say out of out of everything it's probably the gratitude journaling that helps mm -hmm. me to be the most um the most reflective and I I think it's made a really big impact I, I don't think that the power of gratitude could be very over exaggerated mm -hmm. you know I think it like it just it changes your outlook it changes um it focuses you it trains you to focus on the positive things and mm -hmm. I now I'm looking at your plants and I'm like, oh, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, well, I, I wouldn't I remember it anymore. <laughs> so you said Hezekiah is a story about prayer that you really mm -hmm. love. And is there another story or maybe a specific prayer in scripture that you reflect on frequently or a lot? When I wrote Beloved Daughter, I had a, a prayer that I rewrote from Psalm 91 that's mm -hmm. um it's like a psalm of protection it's the one like the arrow will not harm me by day the pestilence mm -hmm. by night maybe it's I might have gotten that backwards but um that was that was really special because I knew going into writing that novel that I was kind of walking into like a spiritual battle mm -hmm. and so that felt um really special never mind the question once more was what are there any characters in scripture whose prayers you go back to? Yeah, or? I think a lot about Hannah too. Mm -hmm. I think about when like she was so earnestly praying for a baby that like the priest thought she was drunk. Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> she was great. <laughs> and, and, and I forget exactly the language she uses, which is like, no, I'm not drunk, but I'm pouring out my heart to God. And I, I loved that picture of just like, I am taking everything. Because sometimes like if you're, you're a person who feels very deep. You're like, sometimes words aren't quite enough, mm -hmm. you know? And so I really loved that picture of, um, I picture her almost like as taking this wordless longing that's in her chest and just like reaching into her chest cavity and ripping it out. I mean, like, God, this is what's in here. Mm -hmm. um, another one I really like also Hezekiah, I think, is uh, the king gets a letter from the enemy army and it's basically like, you know, we're going to come attack you. Mm -hmm. And he takes the letter into the temple. Like he lays it out before God. And I think it's a similar picture. It's like, God it's like, it's laying everything out on the table. Literally it's God, this is what's going on. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. um, God, this is the letter I just got from the doctor. or This is the letter from the bank or, you know, mm -hmm. like this is what's going on. Because I think it's another example of a time to like putting it into like full sentences might not work at the moment. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you have to start with like, God, you know, what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I have thought a lot this year about even how even just God's name, because Kennedy does have mm -hmm. some short snippet prayers, just these like thrown out there because mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of time to think the situation, mm -hmm. how like God's name in itself is almost a prayer. Like yeah. all he is mm -hmm. is in that word. Yeah. And we can trust that he will hear that. Yeah, I guess. Uh -huh. But then there's also that sense of he already knows. So <laughs> now I'm in a spiral. Uh-huh um let me find my oh have you ever wondered or thought about who in specific your books are going to like do you ever hear back because I know that your books you talk about they are prayers for a certain situation mm -hmm. they're prayers for the persecuted church or for whatever's mm -hmm. going on do you ever wonder who gets or do you ever hear back from someone who's like wow this was I do but I try to do it um to me, it's a little easier. So for example, like I don't look at individual Amazon reviews, uh -huh. for example, I try to get like the big picture. What's the general consensus mm -hmm. <laughs> about this? Um, I'm trying to think if I have any great stories. Okay. I will tell you our favorite, favorite story in the Praying Christian Women podcast, because we did have someone write in way early when we started podcasting. <laughs> so this is a prayer story um, specific that a podcast listener wrote in. 
but it has become our favorite and it has completely risen to the level of like urban legend. No, like we've gone back, we've tried <laughs> really? to find the email. We've tried to like ask on air, if this was your story, will you write us again? Cause we want to make sure we're getting in the details, right? Like it's a myth by now. <laughs> okay. But the story goes, there's a family and um, let's call it the grandma. I, for, I don't know all the details or I've forgotten them. Grandma gets real sick, like real sick really fast like everybody's mm -hmm. there and she is just not doing well and so everybody decides okay they're gonna pray for her and then they finally ask the little girl she's maybe like four says well do you want to pray for grandma and so she goes up to her and she says dear god thank you for the food amen <laughs> and the grandma starts to feel better <laughs> and uh, so like i love hearing stories like that about oh, oh, um my. you know just just yeah the power of prayer if i were to um if i were to do any type of historical fiction based on real people i forget which missionary it was um i know we talked about her when we were um but she was um, sent in to basically like there was a prison riot going mm -hmm. on and she was sent in and I don't even remember why they sent her in but like you know here's this like little foreigner woman um, who basically like had the boldness to stop these prisoners from rioting um, I don't remember specifically if she prayed but if you know if I were writing that scene it would you know it would mm -hmm. have a prayer involved there <laughs> I guess oh man what what would you say to encourage someone who is weary in prayer? Because there are points where yeah. Kennedy is like, I am exhausted. <laughs> yeah. I think it's okay. Uh, we are not meant to, to fervently intercede 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And like our brains couldn't handle that. And our bodies couldn't handle that. And I think about Elijah when he was so, um, so depressed in the wilderness. And God was like, you need to sleep and you need to eat <laughs> mm -hmm. and so sometimes like after a prolonged time of prayer I think it's actually good to do something very just gentle with your brain gentle with your body maybe that's scrolling through like puppy videos for an hour like that is okay <laughs> <laughs> um uh you've said that the books are like an overflowing of your heart of prayer and the persecuted mm -hmm. church um are there other topics or things like that prayer has maybe led you to write about or put in your book? Yeah, um, it didn't come much in this series, but I definitely have a heart for victims of trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, the book Save Me Once is the one that deals most specifically with that. Um, broken marriages, especially I've got a couple books where um, it's like one of them is a believer, like one spouse is a believer and one isn't. And I know that's a really, really hard situation to be in. So yeah, it's it's a lot of the characters that I um, end up writing about are basically, yeah, people that I, um, if I feel like I want to invest my like compassion. I want to send them my prayers and my empathy, um, send them some encouragement, that kind of thing. It's almost like being with someone when you can't be physically with someone. Yeah, yeah it really <laughs> so is. Um, lifeline. Oh, I remember. Um, uh, how much do does your creative life also look like praying and listening? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. how are we supposed to, how much time is prayer? How much time is listening? You're like, like, to me, it's kind of like, do you and your husband like are you making sure that you say just as many words as he says like uh, yeah like no sometimes like sometimes people talk some some people are more talkers some mm -hmm. people are more listeners if I had to guess in your relationship you probably talk more than your husband does and that's like that's how God made you um so on the one hand I feel like it, it can be a little more natural. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go back and listen to our recording of this and be like, well, did she speak as many minutes as I spoke? Uh -huh. Because otherwise we're not in a balanced relationship. Um, so I don't think we need to like count it down to the minute. But again, if it's, you know, if you talk for an hour and your husband doesn't say a single word, that's probably unbalanced, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So, but I, I feel like there's so much freedom. I feel like one 
thing that um, we love talking about on the podcast is how God has really designed us in so many different ways. And so the way you pray isn't going to look like the way mm-hmm. I pray. I might pray. So I could tell you how I do it. Um, I do like a lot of my set aside prayer time is more me talking. Mm-hmm. But I also set aside a lot of time in my day to just be very daydreamy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and that's where I feel like, I'm not like pouring a hundred percent of energy into keeping up a conversation with God, but I am allowing space for, um, for us to communicate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's how it kind of works from my end. But again, I think there's, there's such a wide range of how it could look. Um, some people like God speaks to them by reading the Bible or by listening to sermons or by like study, and and they don't like take time to sit in quietness and be like, God, do you want to say something to me? Because mm-hmm. if God wants to say something, he's gonna put the Bible verse in front of them, right? So mm-hmm. I think that um I think a great question for people listening is like, well, how how has God spoken to you in the past? And then do more of that. Like that's actually mm-hmm. when I coach authors about um like how to get inspired or how mm-hmm. to get over um writer's block it's think about a time when you were inspired or you got over writer's block and what were you doing Mm -hmm. oh well I was on a walk okay go go take more walks yeah (laughs) you know so if you think about like okay like the times that God has really showed up for me I was like I was in church listening to the sermon keep on doing that or Mm -hmm. I was out on a walk keep on doing that or I was listening to worship music keep on doing that because I think you know even when you think about how he interacts with the people like in the old testament where it truly is like God appearing to somebody there's still variety in yeah. how he did it that's a big question in my world right now is how mm-hmm. do how do I know God is speaking to me but mm-hmm. I kind of like that question of in what ways do you listen to God mm-hmm. in what mm-hmm. ways are you setting that aside time yeah. for him mm-hmm. um so besides your dad and your grandma uh-huh. who <laughs> kind of makes appearances in the books um are there any other people in your life that influenced the way you see prayer hmm I I did a lot of like nonfiction reading as a young adult. And I think Mm -hmm. that really helped like not to where I could pinpoint, I was reading this book by this author and this chapter really spoke to me, but just Mm -hmm. kind of being surrounded by, um, you know, they were, they were basically like my, my mentors on paper, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like I have no idea who I am, but, um, and trying to think even, um, like missionary biographies and things like that. I find those to be really, really encouraging. So again, sometimes like the lessons I learned from prayer, sometimes it truly is like, I am a writer and I'm going to write a book about how to pray better. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But other times it's, it's more like, like that, that scene from that um, missionary who just like walked in boldly and stopped a prison, right? Like that's, that's powerful too. So Mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah, the, um, more of the example and then basically like I just have such a like my imagination's always going that I Mm -hmm. almost have like imaginary prayer mentors (laughs) I was wondering does that ever interrupt your prayers like you're praying and then you're like over here okay bring it back (laughs) uh how how weirded out do you want me to make you at the moment you can't I'm listening (laughs) so I didn't realize that I was doing this, Mm -hmm. but I kind of in my head, um, and again, I don't think there was, at the time, I didn't think there was much spiritual to it. I thought I had found this cool mental hack. Mm -hmm. My mental hack was when I would pray for North Korea, which was my prayer burden for a very long time. Sorry if people are hearing my dog whining, by the way. He really wants to see (laughs) Mackenzie. So for a long time, my prayer hack that got me very invested in my prayers, it got me beyond, dear God, help people in North Korea. I pictured myself sitting with a North Korean Christian, and Mm. I pictured the two of us praying together for North Korea. Mm. And like I said, in my mind, didn't think about it at all, didn't think it was anything other than like a mental hack that got me in the mood Mm -hmm. to pray more thoroughly than, like I said, just to do God help North Korea. It's taking a bath. 
And I was, I realized, especially after I wrote The Beloved Daughter, that my my prayers for North Korea had started waning. And it was like, okay, what do I do? Like kind of like in the past, what have I done when this comes up? Oh, I conjure up this picture of my imaginary prayer partner. So I just figured I was going to do the same thing that day. And I was going to pray for North Korea. And she wasn't there. And I started sobbing because what it made me think. And again, like, who knows this true? I, I believe it truly could have been that across the oceans, I was actually praying with a true life believer Mm -hmm. i think that's possible it's also possible that i just found a mental hack and then (laughs) once that mental hack ended it stopped working for me but there was a moment Mm -hmm. where i thought to myself my prayer partner has died Mm -hmm. and i cannot pray with her anymore and that was so uh i was was sobbing my heart out in the bathtub (laughs) is your husband like are you okay i don't think he knew (laughs) oh man so in that I mean, was that in itself something that had to encourage you to pray even more for North Korea? When it did, it was, what was the saddest about that moment? It was this sense of, um, this woman died and I'm the only person in the world who knows. Like that was, Mm. that was creeping again. I don't want to over-spiritualize it. I don't want to claim that I had this very mystical experience, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's also possible. Maybe that was God's way of telling me my, my prayer burden for North Korea had, you know, kind of reached its natural and not that I've stopped praying, but like for that real fervent type of praying. Um, But that sense of like, I am alone nobody knows where I am nobody knows how to pray for me that feels really scary to me like I am and I think that's probably why praying for the persecuted is such a a prayer burden for me Mm because that thought of no but like it's just devastating to think of like it's one thing to be alone and scared it's it's so much harder to think you're alone and scared and no one knows to pray for you yeah I think in the Kennedy series that we kind of see it come out from mm-hmm. the persecuted church. It kind of, mm-hmm. it does weave its way in through yes. a lot of the stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I found that in a lot of the books, a lot of situations where I personally felt overwhelmed, like, how do I even know how to pray? Uh-huh. The stories gave a way to give a face to a person. Right. Does that make sense? A it, face definitely. to it. Like you're saying mm-hmm. the person across from the table, like here's a right. person. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah because like it's easier to pray for your child for example or your best friend or your sister or your pastor than it is to just pray for like in general hope all the pastors in the world today mm -hmm. that's not a bad prayer to pray but when you can picture like your own pastor Mm -hmm. that's different or you can picture your own child that's different and then what I love is to um to take those prayers and then use that as a springboard for intercession for others mm-hmm. as well. So maybe my kid is sick. So I'm going to be spending a lot of my energy praying for my kid. And I'm not going to feel guilty for that. Cause I feel like as a mom, that's what God is calling me to do. But what I can also do is, and God, please help everybody else who is sick, help other mothers who are worried for their kids, mm-hmm. you know, the springboard. Yeah. Um, we talked in the Kennedy books about how prayer moves from that one location it kind of mm-hmm. goes out mm-hmm. like naturally yeah you let it um if you could give an encouragement to someone who's struggling in prayer you had one verse to send them to or one story mm-hmm. which one are you sending and you can't be hezekiah or hannah it can't be hezekiah so like or hannah one verse or one story of encouragement when they're like i don't know where even to begin I like, um, I think it's Psalm 136. It's before a word is on my mouth, you know, completely. Mm -hmm. And I love this feeling of like, God, God truly knows what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. And so you can like, just start with what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, don't try to censor it. Don't try to make it clean and pretty for God. um, Because he already knows what's in your heart. I remember being a little girl and having this feeling um, like, Someone was watching me and I, I didn't attribute it to like, to being God, but I think it was the hunger for God. Like 
there must be somebody out there who knows everything I'm doing and knows why I'm doing it. And mm -hmm. so like when I do this naughty thing, they're like, yeah, that's in keeping with her. <laughs> like I understand <laughs> why she did that, <laughs> you know, and, and just being known so well. I think most mm -hmm. of us crave that, crave somebody yeah. who really knows enough like that's why you've been so fun as a reader because you read deeply. So thank you to your high school <laughs> teacher for that. And so you can say things like, so in this scene, Willow said this one thing, right? And so like, you're paying attention to the details. And I think as people, like we want somebody to pay attention to our details, right? Mm -hmm. We just, we want to be seen and we want somebody to, to try to dig in like, why, why mm -hmm. does she like that book so much? Why, you know, or why mm -hmm. is she, you know, why is she doing this? Why is she praying this way? And so just remembering like God, God knows you so fully. I think that's a cool place to start in your prayer life. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, well, I guess even how you react to that. God knows me fully. Cause where I sound like that gives me so much freedom. Like I don't have to yeah. cry, yeah. you know, because he knows me so, so yeah. well. Uh-huh. One thing I wanted to have, ask earlier, maybe point out, uh -huh. is one thing the Kennedy books did for me was I had certain reactions to the way certain characters did things uh -huh. that may not have been wrong. I just didn't <laughs> like it. And I felt like it was giving like maybe this way of praying or maybe this thought of theology is it's okay to look at, but mm -hmm. I felt a reaction towards uh -huh. it that was very revealing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, absolutely. And and that's kind of some of the purpose. So for listeners who haven't li um, read the Kennedy books, they they can take, you know, some of the more controversial issues or some of the questions that come up in the church. And so, yeah, I try to create characters that kind of provide a glimpse into lots of different sites and most of the time yeah there are going to be like that's going to poke people <laughs> uh -huh. and it's better <laughs> at one point I thought it's better that I'm having this reaction now versus if this happens later oh. on <laughs> <laughs> so you can kind of like get the <laughs> yeah let me flush out my oh, that's hilarious anger <laughs> with this character who's not real <laughs> which is such a benefit to reading the empathy part yes because you can understand yeah mm -hmm. um so you talked about the encyclopedia being mm -hmm. a major point in your like prayer life. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned a few other books. Was there any fiction books that were maybe like a catalyst? Yeah. For I remember really enjoying the um, Bodie Taney World War II series. Do you, did you read that mm -hmm. one? It's a Christian fiction series. And I read it back in high school. And what she did so well is took, couple dozen characters and like wove all of their stories really perfectly into each other's mm -hmm. and I remember realizing okay if an author can do that with fake imaginary people mm -hmm. like God can do that with his real children and, and it really showed me it was around the same time that I was realizing, oh, I can pray about my crush. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> you know, God cares about the details of our lives. He cares enough. Like uh -huh. I remember once, um, and I forget the scene. I'm going to get the details wrong, but like one character was on a train and another character from a completely different part of the story was on the same train, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and just seeing like, wow or like I know that character yeah you know? you're like wait a minute I recognize yeah. them and and being able to to just see okay if a human can make those connections work how much more can God do that mm -hmm. you know I'm trying so hard not to give away parts of the book uh, there is a certain <laughs> part that that hit me I don't know it just kind of hit me upside the head the thought <laughs> of like these things can intertwine and what yeah. if God lets them and what if they mm -hmm. do and what if your prayers are so much God allows them to be so much more impactful than you ever realized right and on a personal level mm -hmm. um do you think I don't know my closing questions you would you would ever write a memoir of your own life or like even your own prayer life? I think I, I've thought about that actually. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a memoir about Silas and the NICU, but I think, yeah, a memoir specific about prayer would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I just would need to figure out like, where to start and where to end because in a way yeah. like well that that's not a story that ends mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like you hope it continues <laughs> like yeah right <laughs> um would it 
what would be like difficult about writing something like that I think in a way um because I I read a lot of memoir I really enjoy memoir Uh um and I find that it can be um interesting it can be instructive it can be encouraging um it can just be a glimpse into a type of lifestyle that I've never lived so and in Mm -hmm. that way that can increase empathy there's part of me that feels like well if I were just writing a book about my prayer life like that feels almost um like Mm self-absorbed in a way you know it's like (laughs) <laughs> Look at how I do things. And not even <laughs> that, just like, do people really care? <laughs> you know, because like, I do have cool stories of answered prayer. I have learned some neat things, but um, I don't know that I, like, I almost feel like I would need something dramatic, like mm-hmm. having a special needs Nikki baby or something to like put it all in a bow. <laughs> well, and I wondered how different or similar it would be to you writing novels because you do mm-hmm. weave your own mm-hmm. experiences and answer right. prayers into those books. yeah yeah I think it'd be interesting I think I would love to do it I don't know that it would be um like a bestseller <laughs> yeah I would enjoy writing it <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> it's like yeah I bet it would be yeah for well, me thank too. you that's because <laughs> it is something that's been in my mind mm-hmm. because um you know or the other way you do it is you write a book about prayer and then you just weave your stories into it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and that might be a little more, like that makes a little more sense, like a memoir. Okay. Yeah. So are you a kidnapping survivor? Uh-huh. Are you a Nobel Peace Prize laureate? <laughs> like, no. who are you? I like to pray and talk to God, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> but it would be, it would be pretty interesting. Um, yeah. I'm going to mull over that. I'm glad you brought it yeah. up. Which is awesome. So much more relatable, though, than most memoirs. <laughs> like, if it said, like, I like to pray and drink coffee, I'd be like, same. <laughs> Sorry. This book is written for me. It's written for you, but uh, how engrossing would it be? <laughs> okay, am I allowed to ask you the question that you started with? Uh, oh, about covering your Yeah. Book? Okay. Um, I love the book, Christy. You and uh-huh. I have talked about yep. Christy, right? I would love to do... Um, almost like Christy fan fiction. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, that would be fun. I would love to rewrite the end of Little Women. I remember really being mad that um, Lori and, and Joe never got together. Mm-hmm. So I would love to do that. I've also had a fun, um, th- these are all my like girly girl dreams coming out. I think it'd be fun to write like an Anna Green Gable spinoff from, um, diana's point of view oh yeah like you know so she you know this is the best friend who watches her grow Mm -hmm. up um and then i also think it'd be really fun to do um like there's some really neat myths there's also some really neat like opera stories i don't like opera music but i think the stories can be really really beautiful so maybe even like rewriting some of those Mm -hmm. for a more um you know like so it wouldn't feel like you're reading the iliad or something but it Mm -hmm. it would be just as interest like (laughs) i've always thought like the iliad the odyssey or something Uh like that yeah set in alaska like you would make some way of it. I love those type of Okay, so we'll do it. We'll start start tomorrow. (laughs) Come on over, bring your coffee. (laughs) We're going to make an Alaskan fairy tale. All right, well, before we end, did you have a favorite, um, did you have either a favorite Kennedy book, character, or takeaway? My favorite character and takeaway is Willow Mm -hmm. because she changes so much mm-hmm. and I think we forget that about people mm-hmm. and forget that about yeah. people mm-hmm. especially as we get older like God can work in anyone yeah and then my favorite character obviously is Woong because now I just <laughs> want a South Korean baby uh, <laughs> but my husband's ready for me to move on to a different book <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> Well, thank you. It was fun chatting with you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I will include a link so that you can grab the nine books in the Kennedy series or they're on Amazon or anything else. It's the Kennedy Stern Christian Suspense Novels. And Mackenzie, thanks again for joining me. And we'll see you all later.